We're glad that you've chosen to close the Lord's Day here with worship with us. I want to bring your attention to a few announcements before we begin the service this evening. Uh, The first is that uh, on May 30th, on Thursday, May 30th, we're going to have a hymn sing in preparation for our celebration of entering the the sanctuary. So that's uh, on your announcement page there on the bulletin. It will be... The Thursday, May 30th, before we enter the sanctuary, we'll have a hymn sing. So please put that on your calendar and and join us for that. Dr. Ferguson, Sinclair Ferguson, will be speaking to us during that time. So a great time of of thanksgiving and worship as we prepare to uh, re-enter the the promised land from our time of exile and uh, enter into the sanctuary. Uh, The second thing I want to point out is that uh, tomorrow, Monday, May 20th, is the registration deadline for CataQuest. So parents, if your children will be participating in that, then then tomorrow is the deadline. So you can see that announcement there in the bulletin. The cost is $55, and the deadline is tomorrow. So please make note of that if uh, you want to take advantage of that opportunity this summer. We want to begin our time this evening with our catechism question, and that's question number 72. So if you'll find that on the front page of your bulletin, I'll read the question and then we'll recite the answer together. The question is, what does the seventh commandment forbid? The seventh commandment forbids thinking, saying, or doing anything sexually impure. The Catechism reminds us that we don't have ultimate authority over our own lives. We have been bought with a price, uh, the Scripture says. Jesus redeemed us with His blood, and we belong to Him. And so we no longer are the king of our own lives, but we serve King Jesus. That's actually the, the, the theme of our service tonight. It's kingdom living. It's this idea that as those who have been brought into the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, we surrender our wills to His as He teaches us how to live for His glory and uh, for our good in this world. So our call tonight, uh, call to worship, is from Psalm 145. In keeping with this theme of kingdom living, the psalmist declares uh, our participation in this kingdom. So I'll read Psalm 145. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and great in loving kindness. The Lord is good to all, and His mercies are over all His works. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and your godly ones shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power, to make known to the sons of men your mighty acts and the glory of the majesty of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. Why don't we stand together as we pray and invite God to to meet with us during this time. Let's pray together. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we give thanks to you, and we declare that your kingdom is over all, and it endures through all generations. We praise you as those who have been bought with the precious, priceless blood of Christ and brought into this kingdom to experience its blessings. Thank you that you've delivered us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We ask that you would come and meet with us this evening. Remind us of that reality. Remind us of our status as kingdom servants and kingdom sons and daughters as we sing your praises, as we hear the gospel proclaimed, as we're reminded of our our new identity as kingdom servants. And we pray that you would receive glory as our hearts are lifted up in worship and in thanksgiving for all that you have done for us. We ask you to come and do that among us this evening, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together.
Well, this evening we have the privilege of hearing from some of our Vision Pathways, our, our new class of Vision Pathways graduates. So, guys, if y'all would come up here while, uh, go ahead and make your way on up, and so we'll have to kind of spread out over the stage. So some here, and then some of you guys can come over on this side as well. Just to remind you what Vision Pathways is. Vision Pathways is a, a, a one or two year internship, a one or two year program depending on the location, maybe one or two years, aimed at helping graduates transition into the life and mission of the local church. And so there's really uh, three facets to that. We want these graduates that are coming out of campus outreach and getting involved with local churches to connect with the local church community, to continue to grow in their faith, to be mentored and invested in, and to serve. We want them to be engaged in mission in a place where God has called them. So this, is, uh, this represents uh, graduates who are coming out of, of campus outreach this year. And there are two groups of people. Some are going to be coming here to Augusta to be uh, partaking in Vision Pathways Augusta. And some, re, uh, some are going to be going to Richmond, Virginia. We have Vision Pathways uh, locations that they're beginning to spring up uh, all over the, the U.S. So here in Augusta, we have a team in San Diego, and as I mentioned, uh, some of these grads are going to Richmond, Virginia to start a new Vision Pathways team there. And so they have been in, in town this weekend to do some pre-field training, uh, preparing them as they leave this summer to go to these new places, coming here to Augusta, some of them, and others going to Richmond to help them prepare for this transition where they can continue to connect, grow, and serve with the local church. And so what I want to do is just to, to get two of them, I'm going to interview uh, a couple of them. So Stephen Hogan, if you, where is Stephen? Okay, Stephen, I'm going to let you stand right here since, uh, so you can speak into the mic. Stephen was a graduate of Georgia College just recently, walked across the stage, got that coveted diploma, and uh, is, is now going to be heading to Richmond, Virginia. So Stephen, I wanted you just real briefly to, to share how you came to Christ and, and your experience in campus hours. Just a 30 second, 30 second uh, sum up your last uh, four years in 30 seconds. It's pretty basic. Uh, um, I mean, to put it simply, I mean, I was just living for me. Like, I was trying to serve me any way I could. I was trying to be, be happy by, by things, just by, by drinking, by relationships, by friends, by popularity. And... Um, after 20 years, I just realized it wasn't it wasn't working. It wasn't it wasn't cutting it. There had to be more. Um, so after I I somehow ended up on a summer beach project as part of campus outreach, and um, I I would just start investigating. I tried to actually learn uh, what what this more what what could be offered um, beside beside worldly things to to gain happiness and joy. Um, and the answer just is plain and simple: it's Christ. Um, so after investigating and uh, being asked to give my life to Christ, I, I have, and I, it's, it's been great. It hasn't been the easiest thing in the universe, but um, it's, been, it's been a good ride. It's been the best thing I've <laughs> <laughs> A good ride so far, and uh, I'm sure a good ride to come. So, well, part of, part of that ride is God sent somebody into your life, a uh, campus art staff person or somebody, a student involved with the ministry? Yeah, it was Rick Halkin. Okay, so uh, one of our staff at, at, uh, going up to USC now. And God intercepted your life there and changed the direction of your life. And now he's taking you to Richmond. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how you sense God calling you to Richmond and, and your vision to be there. What you want to see him do in and through your life in Richmond, Virginia. Okay. Yeah, with Richmond, uh, when it was first mentioned to me, I, I immediately put it on the side of my brain, I was just, I'm not going to do this. Like after college, I, I want to get a job and I want to get money. Um, and just kind of, just thinking about it more, um, it just, it kept, it kept popping up. And after, after this training that I've gotten in, in college and uh, just learning Christ, growing in my relationship with Him, I don't want to stop that. And living missionally, just this past year is when I just really started to live missionally uh, and Campus Outreach just really, really plugs that. And... I've loved it. Just pouring out my life and being poured into, or poured into, um, it's been great, and I don't want to stop that. So with Richmond, they have a program set up for us to just to pour out our lives and to be poured into, uh, and to keep training and to keep growing um, as a Christian. Um, so I'm just I'm I'm really excited. Okay, great. Thanks. Appreciate that, Stephen. 
Uh, Sam, hand me where is Sam? Sam, why don't you come here and share. Sam is a, a graduate from Mercer University. And uh, why don't you tell us, Sam, what you're coming here to Augusta. What is it about Vision Pathways Augusta that, that drew you here? Yeah, yes, sir. Um, so I graduated a week ago. Um, and when I was starting this process of thinking about where I wanted to go, there were a couple of things that I was looking for. And the first was a strong Bible-believing church um, and a community of like-minded believers that would be able to spur one another on to love and good deeds and to bear in one another's burdens and share um, in one another's joys. And so I knew right off the bat that coming here would definitely fit that. Um, and then secondly, I was looking for a place that would be able to set me up well for what I'm convinced the Lord has called me to do um, in the future, and that's medical missions. Um, so I just began to seek counsel. Um, even some medical professionals from here who don't even know me were willing to talk to me on the phone and um, email with me back and forth and just give me more practical um, insight on what it looks like to walk with Jesus um, and to do medicine as a career. Um, so I've been um, affirmed step after step, um, seeing that this is really where the Lord has me, um, and I'm excited to be here. Great. Well, uh, something that's new in Vision Pathways this year, we've had all of our graduates living downtown the, the past three years, and this year we're actually going to have a portion of these grads live in a different place in Augusta, up, in, uh, up on the hill in Oak Hill Apartments, and we really want to reproduce this same model that we've seen downtown and the impact that's happened on Telfair Street to happen among uh, international medical students in Oak Hill. So why don't you share with us just a little bit about your vision for being a part of that? Yeah, yes, sir. Um, I was really excited when we found out that we were going to be, or part of us were going to be in Harrisburg. Um, Isaiah 6022 says the smallest one will become a clan and the least one a mighty nation. So I'm excited to see as um, this small group of us step out into Harrisburg to see how the Lord um, will bless us and hopefully grow our ministry there. Um, but I'm also excited because there are tons of international students that go to MCG that are doing research. Um, so we have a great opportunity to be able to impact the nations um, just by going a couple streets down um, to Harrisburg. So I'm excited to see how the Lord is going to use us, um, hopefully to impact the world. Okay, great. Thanks, Sam. Well, it's just a little snapshot. I wish we could interview all these uh, grads and have, you sh have them share their story with you about what God's done in their life over these last four years and how He's calling them out into mission to impact and transform uh, the lost world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we're thankful for you guys. We're going to pray for you here in just a minute. I'll to invite the ushers to come forward now as we prepare for this evening's offering. And uh, as we do, again, this is just a, a reminder of what we see them doing, being intercepted by the gospel of Jesus Christ, as, as Stephen said, uh, and being taken on a new ride, uh, a ride that ends with the glory of God and the salvation of the nations. And we're excited to see, uh, to send them out as those who have been impacted and now who will impact the lost world for Christ. So let's uh, join with me as we pray together for this uh, evening's offering. Father, we're so thankful for this great uh, work of redemption that you've worked in the lives of these graduates standing behind me. Thank you for uh, story after story, as uh, Stephen shared, uh, of going, people going their own way, uh, only to be intercepted by a laborer who came to share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you for your work of redemption and transformation and for, for giving these graduates a vision, uh, not just to, to, to go into this next phase of life and, and be focused on themselves, but to be focused on on you and your work and serving in the world to make a difference uh, and bring the transforming power of the gospel here to Augusta, Augusta and to Richmond, Virginia. We ask that is, is that as they go out that you would give them everything they stand in need of and use them powerfully in the communities where they will be serving to bring the light of the gospel and the hope of the gospel to those without. Father, we also want to pray as well for those going out from our own midst uh, this week uh, as part of the disaster response ministry to minister to those in Adairsville, Georgia, who've uh, been affected by the, the tornado a few weeks ago. We ask that you would uh, be with them as they partner with Grace Presbyterian Church and pray that they would be an encouragement to those who are already serving, trying to meet needs and uh, to share the gospel and in the midst of 
uh, meeting people's physical needs. Pray that you would strengthen and encourage them and that they would be a blessing to this work there in Adairsville. We want to pray also for uh, those in, in our body and ask that you would make us all uh, salt and light where you have us in our communities. We want to pray specifically for the Bel Air Parish this evening and we pray for the Englishes and ask that you would bless them, make them salt and light. We pray for Lauren and Josh Griffin, Elias and Daisy, for Jody and James Hudgens, for Chris and Gary Johnson, Grace and Courtney, and for uh, Leslie and Jeff Lee. We ask that you would bless these as they serve in their neighborhoods, as they uh, hold out the word of light so that others might be drawn into this relationship with Jesus. We thank you for the giving of your people, and we ask that you would bless this evening's offering, and as your people give generously, that you would use this, these resources to further the work of the kingdom, uh, that all may know of the glory of Jesus and may give him his due worship and reverence. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.
Turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. This announcement didn't make it into the bulletin, but college students that will be here this summer, there's a cookout at the Heron House at 6.30 on Thursday night. You're welcome to come. Jay Miller will be with us last few times. He'll be with us uh, for the Bible study with the students, and then uh, we'll also talk about the college Bible study and plans for that. I have to confess that I was not as bold as I wish that I could be, and uh, this week Andy Lee uh, bought all of the pastors a special gift, and uh, and, uh, he bought us these, uh, the tartans of the Hawaiian church there, these... And all week I planned to wear this in preaching this tonight. I want you to know that I just got cold feet, and uh, I don't know, it's, it's, it's not you, it's just, I, I'm blaming on my father and what he's done to me about fashion, I guess. But, uh, but in honor of Andy as he's leaving us, I'm going to wear this as a sash when I read the scriptures tonight. <laughs> so I want you to know your impact will go on and on, my brother. Okay. Ephesians chapter 4. I promise I will do this. Okay. (laughs) So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity... They have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and and speak truthfully to your neighbor for all members of one body. In anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but now must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let your unwholesome talk come out of any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed. For the day of redemption, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Let's pray together. 
Thank you for your word, Father, and thank you for your spirit as we talk tonight about the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Speak to us and teach us, we pray, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. These verses are probably the most important verses on sanctification found in the New Testament. Maybe that's overstated at some, in some way, but Ephesians chapter 1 through 3 has been God's explanation of the rich and full blessings of the work of salvation. And the fact that God was not only at work before you came to Christ, God was not only at work before you were born, God was at work somehow before the beginning of time, the foundations of the world and what that means, all to bring about a salvation for you and a salvation for me. And Ephesians 1 through 3 has been building on this concept, that salvation that is as deep as the ocean and as rich in knowledge and as wide and far-reaching as crossing the whole planet. And it stretches before time until time never ends. It's salvation. It's a gift. My gift, says the Lord, my gift to you. But Paul is saying here to the Ephesians, and I think speaking to us as well, is you don't understand the gift that God has given you. You don't understand even as you've received this gift. You don't understand the implications of its power to transform your life. Now, uh, I want to give two illustrations. I, I may have given them, these before, maybe many times, but two, two uh, examples or illustrations to try to understand what Paul is saying as it relates to our lack of understanding, and then also to understand what it really means to activate the salvation that is really ours. Now, it would be equivalent, um, each of us receiving salvation would be equivalent uh, at some level, in a very more shallow way, to uh, someone receiving an extravagant gift like a brand new car given to a rural tribe in remote part of Africa. A rural tribe uh, in a remote part of Africa receiving this brand new gift. And no doubt it looked pretty amazing when they got it. And it was beneficial that when they first received it, it was placed on the top of a hill. And so they saw the wheels and they saw that uh, the uh, steering wheel could turn those wheels and they thought, wow, what a ride, <laughs> what a ride. So they piled in and they headed down the hill and it was a ride. It was a ride all the way to the bottom. But I tell you, pushing that car back up to the top was quite a burden. In fact, uh, after a few experiences like that, that tribe would begin to think, this is really not much of a gift altogether. There's a little you know, small window here that's uh, quite enjoyable, but it seems more, more of a burden. It seems more uh, difficult uh, than uh, a blessing. But then the giver of that gift uh, arrived and talked about that key. There was a key that could turn that car on. And, you know, that automobile is designed not for you to push it up and down the hills, that car was designed to carry you and to take you places that you couldn't go in speeds that you could not achieve. So Paul is saying here, you need a key. It is a gift. It's foreign in a way, but you need a key. Now, um, he goes on to explain the nature of this gift, and uh, I will illustrate that maybe by looking at aspirations uh, that we have, you might say, to experience. Let's say that everybody in the world had decided that to measure meaning and purpose in life, you had to win a gold medal, a, a win a gold swimming medal. Let's say that for you swimming enthusiasts, let's say that the only way to measure meaning and purpose in life was to achieve the gold medal. And so you uh, could travel around the world and talk to people about their ambition and ask them, what are you living for? What is your purpose? How do you find meaning and significance? 
And they would, no matter if you were in Africa or uh, in East L.A., the answer would be the same. I'm living to win that swimming gold medal. That's, that's the standard. That is what life is all about. So your follow-up question would be, well, tell me, what are you doing to prepare or plan, what is your plan for accomplishing your goal? And uh, one place you might find that there's uh, Kenyans who are running up and down a mountain. And they would say, our plan is just to exercise as much as we can. And you might ask, have you ever been in the water? Oh, no, 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 <laughs> we don't go in the water, but uh, we're trying to exercise all we can. Maybe you go to another group and uh, they're in the Colorado Rockies, and they are pushing heavy boulders over cliffs. So your plan, what is your goal? My goal is to swim and win that gold medal. What is your plan? Well, my plan is to push these boulders around. Well, uh, you come across someone, and they have a small pool in their backyard. You think, well, okay, well, it'd be interesting to interview this person. What is your goal? Well, my goal is the same. I want to win that swimming gold medal. Well, what is your plan? I get in that pool once a month, and I swim from one side to the other, the long side, <laughs> and I'm on my way. Well, at some point, you know, someone uh, like Michael Phelps, maybe, uh, or someone like, um, you know, a famous swimmer, that w uh, another famous swimmer we might mention, Ryan Lochte, or someone like that, might begin to tell us what plan is really necessary to prepare to win a gold medal like that. You know, Michael Phelps was 11 years old swimming in a little tournament or meet, whatever they call those things, meet. And a coach, Bob Bowman, was at the meet. And he came to that young boy and he said, he, when he's getting out of the water, he said, do you have an aspiration to win a gold medal? And you know, he said, you could win a gold medal if you will let me coach you if you'll let me train you. And the story goes that his family did commit to Bob Bowman, and he trained Michael Phelps from the time he was 11, six hours a day, swimming eight miles a day, six days a week, for 16 straight years. Bob Bowman said, I'll tell you, if you want to win that gold medal, you need a coach who knows something about preparation. Well, that's really what this passage is saying. Paul says you need a key, and Paul says... You need a coach, and if you're going to understand the gift of salvation, that trainer, that key is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the key. The Holy Spirit is the coach. Now, let's look back in the passage, Ephesians 4 there. He begins to say, you know, you're no longer to live as the Gentiles in the futility of, or live like the Gentiles, the futility, futility of your thinking. They are darkened in, your under, in their understanding, separated from the life of God because of ignorance and that is due to the hardening of their hearts. They've lost all sensitivity and continue to give themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity and their lives are full of greed. Now Paul is saying, we have a problem here. You're, you have come to Christ and the gift of salvation has come to you, and you're still living as if Christ is not in you. You're still living as if the Holy Spirit is not present with you. He says that you can look here, the description of their life before Christ, their identity, as you see on the outline, is they're still futile in their thinking. They still think the same way they did when they were unbelievers. And their attitude in the community, their hearts are hardened. There's no compassion. There's no servanthood. Though they have understood at some level the gospel that has come to them, here, even in their relationships with one another, it's filled with anger. It's filled with bitterness. It's filled with, their lives are still filled with rage, brawling, slander. Every form of malice characterizes their community. And then he says, as it relates to mission, they're still more indulgent than they are serving. They're still, they're still more focused on sensuality. 
And they're not focused on speaking the truth to one another. Now, he goes on to describe their new life in Christ. And he uses these same categories. I'm going to go past this. We'll come back to that. He uses these same categories of identity, community, and mission. And he says, you have received the new self, renewed in the spirit of your mind, which is the likeness of God's image created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. You're made new in the attitude of your mind. And then he speaks of this new community. He says, you now have a heart of compassion, a heart that not only longs to forgive those that are near you, but a heart that is able to forgive those that are near you. And then he says, you have a new mission. You're to speak the truth to one another, and you're thinking more about another's progress than you own your than your own comfort. You're thinking more about another's growth than you are just indulging your own pleasures. Your friends, your family, your leaders, let me just ask you that. Would they say you're living in this new identity? Your wife, gentlemen, would they say, well, I know this, my husband is living in his new identity. Roommates, would you say about your roommate, they are living in this new identity? Paul says, you didn't learn Christ that way, and yet you're still living as if Christ is not present, and that the Holy Spirit is not in you. Uh, recently in our young adults class, we did a series on calling, and um, I listened to people talk about work. We, we talked about... Um, a biblical understanding of work and understanding calling and what causes people frustration in their work. And I just listened as I and interviewed and discussed and talked to young adults when they talked about their work. Most of their disappointments and frustrations that related to work were related to the relationships that they were involved with. It wasn't necessarily the work itself, but it was the people that they worked with and the circumstances that caused them to feel and to do things that they weren't very comfortable with. And as I listened to it, I thought, you know, that's not a lot different than when Sandra and I meet with couples in premarital counseling. When we're talking to couples in premarital counseling, we either get one extreme or the other. One extreme is, oh, I can't wait to get married. It's going to solve all my problems in life. And I found the perfect spouse. And it's going to be happily, happy ever after. It's going to be that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. So it's, you know, a, you know disillusioned, let's say. <laughs> disillusioned as it relates to marriage. Or it's the other. They begin to, they, they get close to another person. All of a sudden what comes out is all the fears and all of the hurts and all of the problems that have they've been in their relationships, but people have been at a distance. And we can't even get through the premarital counseling where they're so overwhelmed with the reality. This is going to be hard, and this is going to be costly. And I'm not sure I can love that person the way the Bible calls me to love, and I'm not sure they can love me. And, uh, and the answer in marriage counseling and the answer in work, at some level, the answer Paul is saying is, you're going to have to get to the place in your relationships where you understand the power of the Holy Spirit makes all the difference in how you live the Christian life. Now, let me just ask you that. Today, what amount of time did you give to thinking about the presence and power of the Holy Spirit? Let's think about this last week. Identify in your mind the place you were the most frustrated the place that you are the most angry, the place that you are the most disappointed, the place where you're the most hurt, the place where you were the most disoriented. How long did it take you to acknowledge that as a Christian, the Holy Spirit lives in you? At what point were you, did you become aware of the fact that Paul says you're a new creation? You're to put off the old self and to live in the new self, the new self that says you were created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, 
There is a diagram. Um, there's usually always a diagram when I'm teaching. Uh, and uh, there is a diagram in your bulletin. And I wanted to just explain it. It looks, it's quite busy, but um, I wanted to explain it. We, we dealt with this in more detail in our young adults class. But when you talk about relationships and emotional health, there's basically four quadrants that reflect what it means to live in strong and healthy relationships. There's the component of collaboration where we work together. There's the co component of disclosure where we live together. There's the component of understanding where we um, uh, seek to uh, connect together. And this is the component of change where we grow together. And so uh, in collaboration, there's a, a reality where part of what it means to collaborate is that you are serving. And part of what it means to collaborate is you're asking for help. Now, all of us probably have a bent that we're comfortable with, even in that one little uh, quadrant. We either love to serve or we resist serving, uh, and we, we never want to ask, uh, we never want to uh, be asked to, be, uh, to help at all. Or we always are asking for help, and we're walking around looking for people that need to help us, so collaboration is about other people helping us. Uh, or disclosure. We might be the kind of person that is always asking questions, that's always seeking to understand how you're doing. So we're very comfortable with listening, but we might be very, very guarded when it comes to transparency. So disclosure is always one-sided with us. Or maybe we always, you know, we just, you ask us a question and we'll tell you everything that's gone wrong and all of our problems. And, uh, you know, you'll, we'll go on and on and on and on and tell you more than you want to know. Because transparency is not our problem. <laughs> but listening and maybe uh, finding out how you're doing might be our issue with disclosure. And then the area of understanding. Uh, do we really seek to display compassion when others are struggling? Do we really seek to walk together when others are struggling? Uh, or we're just principled. You know, basically in the area of understanding, when someone shares with, we've got the answer, we tell them what they need to do, and uh, let's move on. That's how we live. That's what keeps us out of trouble. And so we spend our lives based on principled direction, and it uh, works good for us. Why is, what's your problem? Why is it not working for you? <laughs> and it can work the other way. We can be so full of compassion that a person is asking for help and they're asking, we need understanding and we need to be trained to be able to give them principled understanding, a uh, principled direction. And then the area of change. Some are curious and want to start something new all the time. Others resist change and uh, they want structure and they want everything to be the same tomorrow as it was yesterday. And uh, they hope that the next day will be like that. And if it is, we'll all have a happy day because that is uh, joy in life to them. Now, in those areas, collaboration, understanding, disclosure, and change, when you move close to a person, to love them, it's going to require you to be something that you're not naturally comfortable with. It's going to require, require you to do something that you don't just naturally do. You don't naturally ask a question and listen. Maybe you don't naturally share what you're really feeling. That's why you need the Holy Spirit. You, if you're going to grow in your relationships, you need the Holy Spirit to be able to be more than what you are. You can't just say, well, this is who I am, and this is how they need to accept me, and if they don't accept me that way, then they don't really love me. We're to be living in the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So what's the key? How do we live in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. What does that really mean and how do we do it? Well, I want to tell you that I believe that Paul is saying the key is worship. The key is a life of worship. The Holy Spirit has come into our lives to make you and to make me a worshiper of God. And when we when we receive that key and decide that's going to be our goal in life, that's going to be what we are banking all of our hope in, it's transforming. The key is worship. Now, I want to illustrate that by both looking more broadly in the passages around Ephesians 4, but also I want to read from Martin Lloyd-Jones' book, Spiritual Depression. It's very helpful to... Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones is very concise 
in his chapter about dealing with fear. And um, he speaks on this issue of the fullness of the Holy Spirit in reference to 2 Timothy 1.7 where Paul says to Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. But just listen to what uh, Jones says. It's a little wordy. I want you all to stay with me. It's very powerful. But just listen to, he's speaking to Timothy. So this is Paul talking to Timothy, and he's talking about what it means to live as if the Holy Spirit is really with you. So listen. Timothy, you seem to be thinking about yourself and about your life and all that you do as if you were still an ordinary person. But Timothy, you are not an ordinary person. You are a Christian. You are born again. The Spirit of God is in you. But you're facing all these things as if you're still what you once were, an ordinary person. Yes, you have trouble. Yes, you have difficulties. Yes, there's persecutions. But Timothy, you must remind yourself You've been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. You need to realize this because when you do, your whole outlook upon life in the future will become essentially different. Sufferings will still come, but you'll face them in a new way. We must face everything in a new way. And the way in which we face all of these things is to remind ourselves The Holy Spirit is in us. There is the future. There is a high calling. There is opposition. There is an enemy. I see it all. You see it all. But I must admit, I am weak. I lack the necessary powers or propensities to face life's challenges. But instead of stopping there, and this is very important, listen to this. Instead of stopping there, I go on to say this. Yes, I know I'm overwhelmed. Yes, I know I'm confused. Yes, I know I'm hurt. Yes, I know I'm fearful. But we go on, Timothy, and we say, but. And the moment I use that word, but, the Spirit of God is in me, something changes. Because God has given me the Holy Spirit. The moment I say that, the whole outlook changes. In other words, we have to learn to say what matters in any situation is not what is true about us, but what is true about Him. You see, worship is that reminder that the Holy Spirit is in me. And we're called in every situation to be reminded that the Holy Spirit is in me, and therefore, I can worship. Now, I said that I wanted to use the context of the passage there. Look in Ephesians 5. We're just going to flip forward, and you're going to see this. Ephesians 5, we're going to move quickly through 5 and 6. But this is the power of this passage here. Now Paul is applying it. He says there in... uh, Verse 15, be careful then how you live, not as unwise but wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to waste or debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, you're to live in the fullness of the Spirit. And the fullness of the Spirit means in every situation, you will remind yourself, the Holy Spirit is with me, and I'm made to worship. I was designed to worship, and I couldn't worship, or I worshiped idolatrous and broken things. And now, I can worship God by the power of the Holy Spirit. He goes on to say, you need the Holy Spirit in your married life. Look at there in chapter 5, verse, uh, he goes on, verse 22. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. Uh, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their own body. 
The language there of feed and care is this idea that we treat our wives, men, as if they are gifts from God. And it, it carries this idea of awe and reverence that we are working to nourish the Holy Spirit in them. And that's our joy in marriage that the Holy Spirit says that in every situation I am to nurture and grow my spouse's belief that the Holy Spirit is with them, that they might be worshipers. And then to our children, chapter 6, verse 1, we need the Holy Spirit in our family life. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Children, you need the Holy Spirit to obey your parents. And sometimes your parents are sinful. A lot of times uh, your parents are sinful. And this verse doesn't say obey your parents when they're doing the right thing. It says obey your parents. And it takes the Holy Spirit to obey your parents, children. And it says to the fathers, do not exasperate your children, fathers. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. How do you do that? You need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit in our work life. Chapter 6, verse 5 says, Slaves, obey your masters with respect and fear and sincerity, just as if you're obeying Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eyes are on you, but as slaves of Christ, do the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one of you for your good. Masters, treat your slaves in the same way. As if it's a worship experience. You treat, you're the leader. You're the boss. They're there to serve you. That's, as a Christian, that's not what Paul says. I, I treat my employees in such a way that they understand the Holy Spirit is in me. And that I'm serving them in such a way that they might worship God and understand that my heart is with them knowing the Father. And then we need the Holy Spirit in our, in our witness. Chapter 6 verse 10 to the end of the chapter. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you may take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities and powers of the dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests because the Holy Spirit lives in you. We're called to live in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And let me just elaborate back to our diagram here. Let's see. You see, Ephesians says that the Holy Spirit is in us, and this means that our identity has changed. We should say to ourselves, the Holy Spirit is for me. We have a new identity. So in any situation when you're experiencing fear, when you're uh, frustrated, when you're walking into a situation and you don't feel confident, tell yourself, the Holy Spirit is in me, and this means the Spirit of God is for me. That means I have a new identity. It changes everything. But then also, we have a new community the communion of the Holy Spirit. Tell yourself the Holy Spirit is with me. In any situation, not only the Holy Spirit is for you, the Holy Spirit is with you. And let me go on and say, by way of application, that when we talk about the need for community and the importance of community, I want you to know it is uh, a blessing to have a spouse or to have a family or to have a roommate that is going to walk with you. But the most important thing that roommate can do in community is not just say, I'll be with you and I'll be for you, is to say, hey, I want to remind you, the Holy Spirit is for you and the Holy Spirit is with you. The kind of community that you need that will bring about, that'll be a game changer, that'll bring about a new perspective is a spouse or a roommate that will remind you the Holy Spirit is with you, but not only a new identity, and not only a new community, the, ho the Holy Spirit is also promised, I will use you. The Holy Spirit will use me. A new mission. Now just think about, I was going to read John 7. I don't have time. I definitely want to uh, 
illustrate this in my own life here in a second. But uh, in John 7, you know, it's the, the great feast. It's the last day of the, the feast. And usually the priest has gone down to the Pool of Siloam and he takes up um, a pitcher of water and he brings it back to the altar and he's going to pour that water on the altar. And that day, John 7 says, Jesus interrupts as the priest is walking back from the Pool of Siloam, headed back into the temple. And uh, he stops and he says, if any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Now, the commentator goes on to say, this he spoke of the Spirit that was to be promised to be given. The Spirit had not been given. Jesus was not yet glorified. But think of the imagery there. Jesus interrupts the, the, uh, the ritual, the practice, the drama, and he says, hey, I want you to know, when I'm in your life, I don't just bring a symbol. I bring reality. And you know what? When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, it's like standing under an unending pitcher of water that just pours over you, over and over, reminding you, God is for me. God is with me. God will use me. You know, every, every morning when you open your Bible to have a quiet time, think about that shower. It should be an experience where the Holy Spirit is reminding you, God is for me. God is with me. God will use me. Can you imagine how that would change the breakfast table? Can you imagine how that will change the trip from home to the car line? Can you imagine how, how that will change when things seem to frustrate us and not go our way? I believe it will change the way God uses us. I do want to illustrate uh, in my own life, um, Anna's home for a few weeks before she heads off to the beach project, and last week we got home from Chris's graduation, and we had very little time, and Sunday afternoon I had a trip planned that I was scheduled to leave, headed to Chicago, and was going to speak for campus outreach in the Central Illinois staff conference, and uh, I was trying to get out the door, and I I just lost it. I grabbed Anna, and I grabbed Sandra, and I said, I don't want to go, and uh, I don't want to leave y'all. And it was just more than I could stand. It was just so emotional. But I, I told Sandra on the way out, I said, this is why they call it a job. <laughs> and uh, I w walked out of the door and hadn't seen Anna. I know she's going to uh, be on the Beach Project. In fact, uh, I'm one of those parents that makes, your, makes our children go to the Beach Project, even if they don't want to. Uh, you're going you're gonna to participate in the Beach Project. Uh, not necessarily some of y'all's experience maybe here. Uh, but uh, Anna's gladly wanting to go to the Beach Project, wasn't that? But uh, uh, I didn't want to go. And uh, got on the plane. Something got, I don't know if it was weather or whatever. Spent about 10 hours in an airport. Never made it to Peoria stuck somewhere between uh, there and Chicago, and, and uh, finally they said, okay, the, the flight's canceled, and uh, you can spend the night in the hotel, you'll go tomorrow, change the whole schedule. You know, I was, you can imagine what I was feeling like, I was feeling like, yeah, you know, I didn't want to go, could have stayed home, the flights were changed, I could have had another day with them. It's about two in the morning, I was trying to go to sleep, and I was in this hotel room near an airport, and it's like the Holy Spirit said to me, Okay, Mike, are you in charge or am I in charge? And uh, are you trusting me or, you know, do you really want my will? And I was very convicted because I began to think of the conversations that I'd had in the long line when we were, they were reroute, waiting on a new ticket, in the shuttle, standing at the hotel. All those conversations were just wasted conversations. They were just focused on myself. I was mad and uh, frustrated and uh, just focused on myself. I felt so convicted. It's like, what am I going to tell these staff next week? I mean, next day. What am I going to tell them? You know, it's like, walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, you know. <laughs> and I said, Lord, I, I feel so dirty and I feel so shallow and so, so small and I do love my family and I do miss them, but please forgive me and will you use me? Well, I to be honest, I felt like I just struggled through those three or four days. Came back home, 
was here um, over the weekend, and I had another trip planned out, and was headed to New York. We have, um, uh, we're looking to do a partnership, our church is, with Redeemer City to City in the Southeast Asia church planning. I was going to meet with J. Kyle, John Hutchison, and uh, before I went, I just said, Lord, I still don't want to go. <laughs> uh, why did I plan this, knowing these were the only days Anna's going to be home, and I'm gone uh, more than she's here, but I, I want to trust you. And uh, I, don't want to, I don't want to repeat that. And uh, so I said, I, I just want to be your servant. I want to be used by you. Well, on the flight to New York, sitting next to this huge West African, and I knew he's, by his language, he's French speaking, I knew, you know, I know what we're going to be talking about. It's going to be Islam here in a second. And uh, so I was a little intimidated, but I said, okay, Lord. Uh, so he asked me what I do, I asked him what he did, did and you know, he, I, he said, are you Christian? I said, are you uh, Muslim? He said, yeah. And he said he was a certain kind of Muslim. He said, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the su Sufism and the Sufist, Sufist uh, sect. I said, well, tell me about that. And he said, well, we're not violent and we're not, you know, we don't believe in jihad. We're trying to seek the presence of God now, not just... In eternity, we don't. We want to. We've been studying, reading, and I said, "Well, you know, that's interesting. I'm gonna be talking about that on Sunday. We we'll talking about the presence of God." And he said, "Well, will you teach me? Will you teach me what you know?" And so we had an hour and a half to talk. I shared the gospel with him. I ended up. He was so interested. I gave him a book by Tim Keller that I, have, I had had in my backpack. We changed and exchanged um, emails, and he said, "I want to know. I want to know more about this. Will you teach me?" And I said, "Well, if the Lord leads, I'd love to." Uh, we spent a couple of days there. On the way back, I'm, I'm really exhausted. And before I got on the plane, I said, okay, Lord, I want you to use me. I don't know what you have for me, but I want you to use me. So I worked my way back to my seat. And there was, best way I could say, Grandma Medea is right here. <laughs> and, uh, and she had headphones on. Now get that. It's like, wow, Grandma Medea, who's you know, kind of current here, she had these big old uh, bass headphones on. And she's sitting in the middle seat. And uh, so I said, okay, well, you know, she's got her headphones. Maybe I, I can just rest and I have to talk to her. So I sat down next to her. Nobody was sitting next to the window. Well, here comes bebopping this surfer dude, and like right before the doors closed. And he's like, oh, I'm in that seat right there. And so she takes these off and she says, uh, uh, she said, she, had, she was over, she had moved over hoping that she could have uh, the seat by the window. And he said, no, 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 I'm sitting by the window. I thought, oh, okay, you know, maybe that's better. So, you know, Grandma Medea starts to move over. And in the last second, he says, no, 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 you know, you stay there. I'll sit in the middle. So I said, okay, Lord, you know, this will be, a, this will be an interesting ride. Let's see where this goes. <laughs> so not long we're talking about his life. He's moving from Florida to South Carolina, been addicted to drugs. All of his friends are drug dealers. He's like, I've got to have a new start. I'm moving to South Carolina for a new start. I said, really? That's what I'm going to be talking about Sunday. I'm going to be talking about how to have a new start. <laughs> he said, really? Well, tell me about that. And we began to talk about the Bible. We shared the go I shared the gospel with him. And, um, and I just want you to know, I don't know that that would have been waiting for me on the first trip. I don't know, you know what the response would, would be, but I know, I know that the difference was I felt and lived in the Holy Spirit <laughs> that second trip, regardless of what the response was. And I know that I lived as in my old self on that first trip. Now, what about you? How do you want to live? You want a life of worship? Of course we do. That's why you're here. Let's pray and ask God to fill us with his spirit. Father, we are humbled and thankful for your spirit. The Holy Spirit is with us. Lord, let us never get, never get over that reality. And every morning, pour over us that reality that the Holy Spirit is for me. The Holy Spirit is with me. The Holy Spirit will use me. Change us and transform us into a people that love in a way that reflects the newness of life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. How deep 
Raise your hands to receive God's benediction because of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, because of the love of the Father. We have communion with the Holy Spirit. God is with us. God is for us. God will use us. Go in that assurance. Amen.